Um, storing water on the land in the right time, in the right processes, allows the waters to soak back into the aquifers and back into the valley for our food to be grown, for the animals to be fed well, um, for trees to grow, and to create a good nature. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Peter. Peter is going to lead the presentation, and um, I hope you find it interesting. I hope you see that we've created some interesting studies already, and that this is just the start of us. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. Well, thanks for coming. I hope I'm not going to bore you too much, right? But I'm going to go through. There's some stuff that we're supposed to tell you because that's what the Environment Agency want us to um, say. But I'm going to try and show you the work we've done um, to look at how water's falling in the valley and what we plan to do and the research we're going to do before we do actually do anything. So, um, what is natural flood management? Well, it's what Ollie's already described. It's using nature to solve that problem. This NFM program came about because many of the brightest minds of government, an oxymoron I know, but came to realize that spend, they couldn't afford to spend more and more money on pouring concrete and dealing with the increasing problems of flooding. And we're seeing that across the region in Hastings and others. Uh, flooding is becoming a much more serious problem. But by understanding often what our forefathers knew about water catchment, we can actually make some changes to land and then we can reduce flood. And we'll see what we're doing. So one of the structures we might use is called a beach. And this is one of the structures that will help stop flooding by holding water back and then releasing it slowly. So there's many processes. The biggest thing you can do to reduce flooding is actually change the habitat, the old habitats, the wooded heath, the bog lawns, the peaty soils. That's really <coughs> what reduces the speed of water flowing over land. And land that's no good for agriculture needs to return to that. And that thick vegetation traps the water, it takes energy on, on steep slopes, and that slows the flow, as they call it. But it does more. As you mimic those natural functions, you actually suck carbon back into the soil. You, you can actually clean the water. So the water starts taking out um, some of the sediments that cause clogging. It can reduce any pollutants in the water. So when we look, what does it look like in the valley? Well, it looks something like this. In the upland area, <coughs> at the top, you want your pretty soil. Right? Soils that can hold water. And if you stand on the peat bog, you might think that you're standing at the same level. But there's peat bogs I've stood on where between winter and summer, you're actually four foot higher or lower. And that's how much water can be stored under your feet in the peat bog. So those peaty, heathy upland soils are really important to storing those red winter rains. As you come down, you want woodland. You can also put in what we call the leaky downs here. Yeah? How you farm some of your fields, cross plowing, going with the contours, you can make little uh, offline storage ponds, and then you can also look at how the channel is. We're not doing that in the Marshall Valley, but purely concentrating on the upland storage. I'll show you some maps later on. So these are all the benefits. We can make a resilient ecosystem. <coughs> we can help little butterflies and birds, little creatures. We can bring back water bottles to the valley if we do it right. And um, so this is Mally Downs where we used to live. We can draw people together working for a common purpose. We can create more habitats, improve that water quality, reduce erosion, and reduce flooding risks, and even help farmers by managing some sediments. The funding requirements we had to do was to deliver approved projects. I won't bore you with the details. We had to demonstrate that it really would reduce flooding. We had to make sure that we provided value for money. We had to align with the local flood risk management plans and strategies. We had to commit to the project monitoring we're doing and have plans to make sure that it goes on in the future and doesn't fall apart. So what does this mean? The 
project aims to help the local community and really what we're trying to do is reduce the peak flow through the village. All right? I'll come to what that means later on. We need to hold the water in the valley sides during the peak rain flow. The first thing we're going to do, so the thing that me and Ollie, Karen and Bill are doing is we have to organise the base research, so some wildlife monitoring and we've got to do more flood monitoring, which we're just about to get installed. Thankfully, Southern Water has agreed to pay for that. And that measures the water flow and the levels in all of the little streams that are coming through the valley. And then we'll gather that data. Then I've got to put all the business plan together with who's doing all the work, how much it's going to cost, and get that approved. But we mostly this year we're taking measurements and scientific monitoring and starting to put them together with the people who've got the skills, foresters and land managers who can do the project. But we know what happened back last year. We've seen the flooding. And the other thing that Ollie has been doing, and I, is the scientific side, engaging an expert to model all this in a computer and tell us whether all our efforts will actually <coughs> stop this happening. So, first of all, we've already analyzed three and four, lots of data. <coughs> and we put that into a graph. And the strange thing is, you think we're getting more rain, but we're not. That's really odd, isn't it? We're not getting more rain. The rainfall for the valley has actually gone down since 1990. And it's, if you look at the statistics, it's actually statistically significant that it's going down. So we're actually getting less rainfall. So something else happened. And the two things that happen is the water's flowing faster off the land, or we're getting clustering effects of that rainfall. <coughs> so we need to model that so we know when the rain hits that the work we do, and as we start doing this work, we will be monitoring to see if it's having any effect. So science is going to tell us if it works or not. This here is what happens in the flood. So these blue blocks are your rainfall coming down. And it gathers on the valley side and it starts coming down. Now the green line is the height of the water which would be at pet level. And you can see that it gathers from all the valley sides and it hits at one time. And we call that the peak flow. And the peak flow is when it floods the village. And our job is just like with what they used to talk about COVID. We have to look at this peak flow and then we have to do things to the valley side that, because we can't reduce the amount of water coming through, still going to be the same amount of water, but what we can do is spread out the time that it hits. So we flatten the curve. That's the key to making this project work. <coughs> Flattening the curve of when the water hits. So we've already done some computer modeling. This is a computer model I made last year, and looking at the EA data, the environment agent data, of where the water comes down the valley, and where we could possibly make changes. And this is what the landowners and our partners uh, started talking about. What would, could we do to make that difference? We so far just commissioned um, some experts in this area to start modeling the data to give us these predictions. And we've made a computer model, as can be seen here, of the entire catchment. The red line is where, that's where the raindrops flow towards pet level, and on the other side they flow away. And we can actually model how every raindrop <coughs> hits each part, how the habitat either makes that raindrop go quickly or it goes slowly into all the different streams. We've looked at other sites where the rainfall is likely to happen, the steepness and the height. And this model shows 
the steepness of the slopes, but it actually shows what that's showing you where the water will flow the fastest, the quickest. And that's the most dangerous thing that keeps that peak flow the highest. And if we can look at where this peak flow comes, now this white line here is the catchment, so we've got to work with it here. And it just so happens that along this line here is the most dangerous part that causes the greatest amount of flooding. And that just happens to be Mummy Down's work here. And Stony Lake Wood here. And Hordes Wood there. And that's what brought us together, is how could we actually manage those woodlands and the grasslands to capture that water and not make it part of the problem. Because a lot of the woodlands, they aren't the best for, and a lot of them have become overgrown with rhododendron. They've lost some of those woody heathland habitats, the wet woodland habitats. And that's what we want to return. As an ecologist, I just want it to return because we get more wildlife, right? And have little night jars fly, <coughs> little water wolves sitting at the bottom of my woodland. But it just so happens, doing the same thing will also maybe stop pet that will from flooding. Here's another one where I modeled where the various flood structures, because we can change habitat, you know, the ground, make it more vegetation, make the soil have more carbon in it, so the water's more likely to penetrate and deeper and be held on. But we can also put in these leaky dams, these structures that create a series of pools that will, at peak flow, will fill and then slowly release. So that's all what we were trying to do. The boring bit is how we're going to do it. So this is what's been going on, and I've had lots of bits of paperwork and spreadsheets to fill in, that we've been working behind the scenes to make this a reality, the filling all the uh, paperwork that's needed um, so far this year, and we're all coming along to getting the project to fully start September, October this year. Okay, so that's when the first leaky dams will start being built and hopefully, well, we've got to wait until the, the birds stop nesting, but towards the back end of summer we'll start making the big habitat change. The first is ripping out all the rhododendron, that's the biggest thing, because well, rhododendron is awful, it makes the soil just really black, nothing's in it, the water just <coughs> shoots straight over it. And preparing to sign the grant agreement, we've just done that. We've started landowner engagement was done very early on with a fantastic bunch of enthusiastic landowners who wanted to be part of it. Remember, we're not getting a penny out of this. This is all the money spent through a charity, not a penny going to landowners. It's all got to be, every single penny has to be accounted for, both by the Environment Agency and by the Charity Commission. We need to engage you, the community. The people who know this valley far better than and I want to hear your views and work with you. I'm not here to impose solutions, we're here to try to do our best and work together. We need to set, we've started setting up the government's governance arrangements, and then we haven't got a bank account yet, we're still waiting on the bank account debt, then we'll start getting the money in, then we've got to get, we've already engaged the experts, we get a detailed design, and we, we will take in people's views as we do that. And that has to be submitted, this whole business case has to be done by September, and then we start getting all the right permits and licenses, because some of it needs planning, and other consultation with the local council, and we get on and do it. Okie doke, and uh, if you have any problem with flooding, there's what to do for the flood line. Okay, and uh, we also, we don't know everything, so we've started bringing in people who do know these things. Um, the High Wheel National Landscape South East Rivers Trust. We've got Southern Water Responses now, who have given a generous donation of £30,000 and expert help. And we'll <coughs> hopefully probably get some more cash to help us as we go down. So, thank you for putting up with me, and we'll start to take your questions, which Craig will check.
a chance to give some feedback and ask questions uh, regarding what you've heard already. I have uh, 20 acres just outside of Fairlight called Stumbling Wood. We have three streams running through it, so they're small, but you know there are a lot of small streams that add up <coughs> to the flow of water that we get down through the marshes so that we're in the level. So, um, do we have any questions?